Hi, I'm Dr. Philip McMillan, and today I want to talk about a very important topic. Does the COVID vaccine increase the risk of infection? Now, this is an important point and one that is not very easy to cover in a short period of time because this will just be a quick discussion. But what you will see in the link below is the ability to register or follow if you're following later next week for me to do a presentation on Eventbrite. This is it here. There's a link below. You can then have me go through in far more detail the importance of this topic. Now, it's not just that it happens. And so I just want to clarify to people that, you know, don't get excited that this is happening. You know, does it mean whatever? The important question is not just that it happens, it's why does it happen? And that's the bit that we really need to dig into. Why would this happen? And what are the implications? The implications both to the vaccinated cohort and the unvaccinated cohort. Really critical information. And where is it coming from? So this has come from a very important preprint and a preprint paper means that essentially it's not yet been fully peer reviewed and therefore they release it when they think the information is very important. So it's risk of coronavirus disease, COVID-19, among those up to date and not up to date on COVID-19 vaccination. This was done in the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, USA. And as usual, I always do a quick check on potential conflicts of interest, and there are none. You can see it at the bottom here, potential conflicts of interest, no reported conflicts of interest. I'm not surprised by that because this is not necessarily something that you would be saying that would benefit the pharmaceutical industry. So there would be no conflict of interest here. So what is it, what is it that they have done? They have looked at their population, that means their workers, and it's a pretty large study. And so this is why I think it had to come out as a preprint, because it has valuable information in it. When we look in more detail at it, you can see here that they were looking across 48,000 working age Cleveland Clinic employees. Those not up to date with the vaccination had a lower risk of COVID-19 compared to those who are up to date. That's a fascinating thing. And this is the chart from the paper. And as I said, I don't have the time to go into it in all the detail, but you can see here in this image, these are the people who are up to date. This is risk of infection. These are the ones who are not up to date. It's lower. Why would the vaccine, people having the vaccine, actually increase their risk of infection. And you can see this is spreading over time, it's getting wider. So this is an important point. As I said, it's not just that it happens, we need to understand why. And that's what I'll be covering in a little bit more detail when I look again at Eventbrite. I'll encourage you to take a look at this here um, and understand what it is that I'm going to be talking about. The, the three main points that I'll be focused on is the points about what happens with regards to interferon with regards to vaccination, what happens with interferon autoantibodies, and critically as well, what happens with regards to IgG4. And this is part of some work that I'd done previously. And this is where we're talking about the class switching between um, from a, after vaccination going to IgG4 um, antibodies. This is likely to have an impact with regards to what we are seeing here. And I'll be going through the virus as usual, the spike protein, the difference between the antibodies, uh, that's a beekeeper. This is what would happen with IgG4 antibodies. I'm just quickly running through some of the points that I'll be making. This is the 4,000% increase of IgG, which I'd covered previously in a presentation, but it becomes very relevant now. And critically, the helping you to understand 
interferon. So this is why I'm saying that these are very important points that I can't cover in a short period of time. But it indicates an important piece of information. When we look at what is happening across the world, certainly this is the UK Parliament here. This is their COVID-19 update. This was March 2023. And in it, they're covering quite a few principles about COVID-19, harmful outcomes of the immune response, immunity est uh, estimates in the population. But critically down here, in terms of prevention strategies, COVID-19 vaccines remain the first line of defense in the government's living with COVID-19 plan. Vaccines protect the individual and benefit the wider population by reducing the risk of transmission. And so this is clearly an assumption rather than a fact, because this is what we are seeing. Anybody who is observant should ask themselves a simple question. Omicron appeared on the scene in December 2021. OK, we are now in June 2023. 18 months after one of the most contagious forms of a virus has appeared, yet it is still circulating. And this is what is very important as well to highlight, even at the Cleveland Clinic, 3% of their, their staff were infected through that period of time. In actual fact, it's likely to be much higher than that, and it continues to circulate. What are the implications of that for the population? And let me just warn people, because I think that people don't quite get this. There are a lot of people who keep on talking about that because it's a coronavirus. This is just a cold. OK, I want you to take a good look at this spike protein. We have never seen anything like this. What the spike protein can do has never been replicated in any other viral infection. This is a beast of a virus. Where did it come from? I'll not comment on that. All I'm saying is that we have never seen a virus with the capabilities around this spike protein. We need to understand it. And we need to critically grasp the implications at a population level of letting this virus continue to circulate among the population. The fact that the infection may be mild in the context of IgG4 and the vaccinated does not mean that this virus cannot do damage. Those are the points that I want people to understand. I'll make a final thought with regards to what I'm saying here. I said in, this is in August 2020. I'll show you this here. COVID-19, modern day rheumatic fever. Essentially, what I was saying is that the parallel disease to COVID-19 is actually rheumatic fever. Rheumatic fever is a bacterial infection in the throat affecting only children where they have an immune response that leads to long-term immune complications, inflammation of the heart, the joints, the skin, the brain, the kidneys. That's rheumatic fever. Here is the problem, and just think about this. When children have rheumatic fever, the challenge is to prevent them from getting further infections with the streptococcus. Because every time they get an infection, it exacerbates the immune response. And guess what we do with those children? For the extent of their life until they are 18 or 21, they are given antibiotics every month as an injection to reduce the risk of infection. That is how serious rheumatic fever is managed. I'm telling you, COVID-19 is going to be in the similar category. The challenge is how to prevent people getting exposed. That's, again, what I'll be covering. And again, I, I encourage you either 
to register for Eventbrite or after that it's finished. I hopefully will have it as a course. You can take a look at it. This is important stuff. I want you all to learn as much as you can and let's stay ahead of the science. Have a great evening, everyone.